Is the middle class disappearing in America? Are all the gains from economic growth going to the rich? I'm Russ Roberts, and what we're doing in this series is looking at how hard it is to measure economic progress. In this episode, we look at how changes in the American family make it hard to understand what's going on in the economy. Let's start with an example from the first episode in this series, the growth over time in household income for the middle quintile, households that earn more than the bottom 40% and less than the top 40%. The average household in the middle quintile earned 7% less in 2010 than in 1979 after correcting for inflation. That's awful. But that measure includes the elderly. If you exclude elderly households as best you can, which you should, if you're trying to see how the economy treats workers, the picture's a lot rosier. But what if you didn't look at the two groups separately? What if you looked at the non-elderly as a single group? Well, you'd think it'd be the average of the changes for the two groups something between 20 and 23%, but it isn't. The answer's gonna blow your mind. It's 12%. Well, that's gotta be a mistake, right? If one group goes up by 20% and the other goes up by 23%, then the percentage change for the two groups combined has to be between 20 and 23, right? But it doesn't. That's because the two groups don't stay the same size relative to each other over the 31 years. When you combine the two groups, you're taking a weighted average but the weights don't stay the same over time. In 1979, there are more households with children. So average household income for the combined sample in 79 is closer to the average of the households with children. In 2010, more households without children. So the 2010 average of the combined sample is closer to the average for the families without children. That flattens the line. It's not even close to being between 20 and 23. That's an example of what's called Simpson's paradox. The change in the average isn't always the average of the changes. 12% growth is a pretty appalling result when the overall economy grew so much faster. But that number combines at least two things, the impact of the economy on the middle class and the changing structure of the American family. The same thing happens with poverty. It looks like a growing economy doesn't reduce poverty, but it's complicated. A study of poverty between 1967 and 2003 shows just how hard it is to disentangle the impact of the economy from changes in the family. Let's start with 1967. Over half of all single moms with children were poor. One in 10 of those who were married with children were poor. 36 years later, what happened to the poverty rate? The percentage of individuals below the poverty line. For people in five of the six kinds of families, the poverty rate fell by more than 20%. So how much did the poverty rate fall for the entire population? Should be something like 20%, right? But a growing economy wasn't the only thing that happened between 1967 and 2003. The proportion of people and families with children headed by single mothers, the group with the highest poverty rate doubled. So the overall poverty rate barely budged. It fell by only 4%. 4%, that's it? That's basically no change at all you'd be tempted to conclude that a growing U.S. economy no longer helps the poor. A rising tide no longer lifts all boats. The rich get all the gains from economic growth. But remember Simpson's paradox. Let's try to isolate the impact of the economy on poverty by holding family structure constant. If family structure hadn't changed, and if poverty rates by family still fell by the rates they actually did between 1967 and 2003, the poverty rate in 2003 would have been 9.9%. That's a 25% decrease. So maybe a rising tide still lifts all boats. You can't know for sure. Maybe the economy affected family structure and made it harder for people to stay married. And it doesn't mean everything's fine. Maybe some people got out of poverty, but just barely. The actual poverty rate hardly changed. That's the reality. The drop of only 4% is what actually happened. But if we're trying to assess the impact of economic growth on poverty, the 4% drop is grossly misleading. The drop in the marriage rate distorts what you see. The same is true for measuring the progress of the middle class. The falling marriage rate in America distorts our measures of progress. Take a simple world of 10 households. Every household's the same, a husband and wife, each earning $50,000 per year. So all 10 households have the same income, $100,000. Each fifth or quintile, captures 20% or one-fifth of total income for this little society. 30 years go by, and they're good times for this economy. Every individual now makes $100,000, twice what they earned before. But over those 30 years, suppose half the families divorce. 
Now there are 15 households instead of 10, and 10 of those households have only one earner. With 15 families, a quintile, a fifth, is now three households. Look what's happened to the middle quintile. Even though every individual has twice the income they had before, the average household income of the three middle quintile households didn't budge. It's still $100,000. Median household income is stagnant, 100,000, just like it was before. And the share of the economy going to the middle class has fallen from 20% to 15. The top quintile, the top three households, now captures 30% of all the income. It looks like all the gains have gone to the richest members of society. It looks like the middle class is falling behind. Yet every individual in this society is earning twice what they earned before. Changes in family structure distort our economic vision when we compare numbers over time. This hypothetical example dramatizes what's been going on in the American family over the last 50 years. An increase in divorce and fewer people getting married in the first place. That means more households with only one adult. The drop in the marriage rate is much bigger for less educated Americans. That means more low-income households in the data, not because the economy is doing poorly, but because less educated people, who on average earn less, are increasingly less likely to be married. That can pull the middle down, not because people are doing worse, but because marriage is less common, especially among those with the least education. How important is this change in the American family for measuring middle-class progress? Unlike the poverty study we looked at that used real data, this example is just hypothetical. How much difference does it make in the actual data on the middle class? Well, that's hard to say. Few, if any, of the studies that claim that the rich are getting all the gains and the middle class is stagnant or falling behind correct for these demographic changes. One way to avoid the problem is to follow the same people over time, independently of what kind of families they're in, and see how they're doing. In the next episode, we'll do just that.